Hello, and welcome back to part three of the show that I've yet to give a proper name to. I should probably do that soon. I was going to call it real time because we're drawing in real time, but uh, at one point I'm going to have to use a little time lapse so we're not sitting through, you know, if I'm doing an 80-hour drawing, I don't have 80 hours worth of video. And also that's a show that already exists. I think it's uh, Bill Maher, I think, has a show called Real Time. And I don't want people looking for real time with Bill Maher and accidentally finding this because these are two very different <laughs> subject matters and very different audiences. So I don't know what, if you, if you have an idea for a uh, show title, um, feel free to hit me in the comments or if you know me outside of, of YouTube, um, you can find me on discord, which I, there's a link to that in like in the description of this video, there will be a link to the Midwest Guild of Fine Art, which is the totally free guild that I've set up. And on one of those pages, uh, I don't know if it's the front page or the join page or what, because my brain has been scrambled for the past few days. There's a link to the uh, Discord. I think it's on the, the join page. There's a link to a Discord there. And you can find me hanging out on Discord most days of the week, usually seven days a week unless... I need to take a complete break from the computer, which is rare. But if you have suggestions for titles for this uh, this series uh, or the channel overall, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Right now, I'm just calling it Midwest Guild of Fine Art, uh, which, which seems not all that creative. <laughs> anyway, today we are going to be laying in the whole background of this drawing, and we're going to go ahead and knock out the hands because... Like right now, if you just look at the girl on the left, it it looks awkward. It looks like a baby bird waiting for a worm. But if you watch the first video in the series, you'll you would have seen the original reference photograph that I'm using. And it's a woman on the right putting lipstick on the young girl on the left. And it's a really cute scene that I really like. And I I want to get more of the content of the meat of this drawing put in here. In order for those hands to have something to stick out against, and in order to start really laying out the different tones and contrasts and variations of grays in here, in order to give this depth, I need to have that background laid in first. There's also a second very practical problem that we're solving by putting in the background, and that is when we start doing the woman on the right, and especially with her, like her arms and double, especially for the sharper features like her hair and her skin to have something to stick out on, we need to have the blurry background in place so that we can purposely overlap some of that blur into the sharper parts of um, her anatomy. And then we can erase the overlaps out. And the reason we do that is because the blurry softer tones in the background will be blurry overall, but not where they meet something sharp. And so if we try to, to draw and lay in that background up against the skin, which already exists, like for instance, if we draw the skin first, then lay in the background, then we're attempting to try to butt up the background against that skin, which is much more difficult. And that's kind of what we've done with the girl on the left. Had I been thinking ahead when I did this, when I first started the drawing, I probably would have laid in the background first and then laid in the girl on top of that. But I'm so used to drawing the, the front focal subject matter first uh, that it's just kind of a bad habit I've developed to do that. So anyway, uh, we're going to do it properly this time. We're going to lay in the background, then lay in the woman on the right and her hands and arms and, and stuff like that. And it just makes things a lot easier. Now this video is going to have something a little bit rare. I like to do these videos in real time so that people can, do, can see what I'm doing as I do it. But we're going to get into a point here in just a bit where I'm, you're just seeing me do this, where I'm just scrubbing in very light tones of gray, and there's not a lot to explain there. That's all I'm doing. I'm taking a, a Q-tip that is not heavily loaded, but still dirty, and I'm scrubbing in very light tones of gray over about, I'd say, 40% of this paper's surface area. 
And so it's going to be very tedious. It takes a very long time. And this is the most boring part of a drawing like this. But I can tell you that if we were to do just the two heads and the hands and the lipstick, it would still look cool. But having that against a bright white, you know, unrefined background would be, in my eyes, too much contrast. So if we add that background in, one of the things that I think makes my portraits stand out versus other people's portraits, and the thing that I think makes them a little different for me, is that I go through the extra steps of creating those backgrounds, even if the background itself isn't very interesting. I personally like to see the entire paper filled up. Now one of the advantages to doing the background this way where I'm filling in large areas and kind of overlapping it into the content that's on the right, is that I can overlap that into areas that I know are going to be darker. So on this one, the woman has hairs that are very, very dark hairs that are coming and swooping and curling over the background. I can overlap my scrub marks for the background into that hair and not have to worry about erasing things out because the dark that I'm going to be putting on uh, to the hair is going to cover up the softer tones that I'm laying in with a Q-tip, the, the softer tones for the background. So overlapping that into that hair gives me an advantage in that you won't see an area where the, the background kind of takes on a different tone because I'm being more careful. I have to change my, my strokes. So the reason that's important is because I'm using a specific comfortable stroke length and pressure whenever I'm doing the background without having to worry about getting it you know butted up against something that's already drawn. If the dark hair was already laid in right now I would have to start being way more careful as I got closer to that hair because if I accidentally got the q-tip into the hair it would pick up very dark charcoal and create massive streaks over the background. Since I don't have to worry about that and I can just scrub into the hair that's not yet drawn, then I don't have to worry about being careful around the edges and then I can just draw over that later. It creates a much cleaner, crisper look to the foreground. I think the only other thing that really needs pointed out before I go into a time lapse for this next section is now since I've already got the, the girl drawn on the left, I'm going to be encountering the problems that I just explained. Um, so when I get close to things like her nose, her lips, I have to start being careful that I don't accidentally pick up charcoal that's already on the paper, i.e. her skin tone, her the, the hard charcoal that's on her lips, the shadows, and things like that. Not only can I create smudges if I accidentally go into that, but I can also change the darkness of the highlights and the shadows on her actual face. So what I'm doing is I'm getting close, as close to her face as I can with the chart or with the uh, Q-tip. And then if I need to define that further, I can go back in with either a, a denser Q-tip that's kind of quote unquote sharper than the one I'm using, or I can use a blending stump and just be very careful. If I get little places where I've gotten clumps of charcoal instead of a smooth gradient background like I'm wanting, I can take a Tombow eraser or a kneaded eraser and very, very lightly um, kind of smooth those down and take some of the, the edge off of the little clumps. And that's all I'm doing for this entire background. I'm scrubbing in the background with a Q-tip and it gets a little darker as it gets closer to that. It's like a picture in the background. The picture is so out of focus. It's like a hotel painting, I think. It's so out of focus that you won't be able to tell what's in the picture, even though this drawing is a fairly big size. It's 18 inch by 24 inch paper. So all I have to do is create the illusion that a picture exists. So in other words, the main point of focus here, whenever I'm using this Q-tip, there's a, l let me point out a couple of things with it. One, I'm making a solid light gray background. that's a little bit lighter than the skin tone on the girl. Two, I'm pushing that right up against the skin, so the hands, the lipstick, the arm, the curls, and I'm not really worried about that um, getting too far into that roped off section. Three, I'm going to be using the Q-tip to do the entirety of the picture frame and the content of that, that wall painting or that wall print picture, whatever you want to call it. 
because all I have to do is create areas of light and areas of dark in order to give the entire thing a contrast. The background cannot be just one big block of gray. That's incredibly boring. So we're going to create a little bit of action by recreating that print or that uh, painting or whatever it is with the Q-tip in order to give, you know, kind of break that up a little bit. You'll see me go back in every once in a while and with a Tombow eraser and sharpen up the edges of skin on both ladies in this drawing because sometimes I'll overlap those Q-tip strokes by accident and that will make the skin, the edges of the skin look really fuzzy. And so in order to get rid of that, it's very, very simple. Take any like kneaded eraser, if Tombow eraser works best for me, and just erase away the little overlap marks and it sharpens it up just like that. So I want to put on a little bit of music, put this in time lapse and get past this background part because the things that you've seen me do so far in this video, I'm just going to continue doing until the entire background is done.
All right, let's start adding some content in here. The first thing that I want to get out of the way is the lipstick. Because the lipstick is going to be a focal point whether we want it to be or not. Because that's the action in the photo. And it's the thing that connects uh, the girl on the left to the woman on the right. It's also the thing that tells like this story. It's, it's what sets the scene. Now, fortunately, we don't have to do a lot of detail in order to make this look like lipstick. So we don't have to spend a ton of time here. All we're going to do is, since this is a cylinder for the most part, we're going to make this darker on the bottom than it is on in the middle. And we're also going to add a little bit of darkness on top and the focal point, the apex that reflects the most light, is right in the center. Because remember, if you look at the girl's hair on the left, overall, there is one like strip of light that goes right through the middle of her hair. And each one of those curls is done the same way. It's darker on top and on bottom, and the biggest reflections are right in the middle of each curl. We want to make sure that we maintain that throughout the entire drawing. So the lipstick will react with light the same way that the rest of the drawing does, especially the hair. Now certain shadows may be stronger, like say at the bottom, those may be stronger than at the top, but the light itself is going to be the lightest thing on the drawing because, duh, and it, it just happens to be situated in the dead center of anything that's round. So in order to create this, all I'm doing is, uh, like I just explained, darker on the bottom, uh, a tiny bit lighter but still shadowy on top, light in the middle, and then I'm going to blend that together with a uh, very small point blending stump and using it almost like a pencil. We're going to smooth that out first, and then we can go back in with a pencil just a little bit later and add texture. So what I mean by texture, since it's like a smooth object, is there's a little line where the lipstick meets the case. We'll put that in, and then there will also be little tiny ridges that are along the cylinder part of the case as well. So we can add those in as well, but we don't want to like put those in too early or too late. Just to make sure that I'm being safe, I'm adding in a tiny, tiny little outline with hard charcoal on the top and bottom. And that's to make sure that the case itself is perfectly straight. I'm not using a straight edge here, so I'm, I need to make sure that my lines are straight and on the money. The other thing is I have to make sure that the angle is correct. You can have two completely straight lines, but if the angles are incorrect, it will make the object look more like a cone, like it fans out at one end and gets smaller at the other. So I need to make sure that they're not only straight, but that they're parallel. And in order to do that, um, I, I outlined it very quickly with hard charcoal. Then I'm going back over it with extra soft charcoal and darkening that up, it, it up just a bit. Then I can take, you know how we normally take a blending stump into the scrap paper and get it dirty. We're doing the same exact thing here, except we're putting the extra soft charcoal on the paper first and then using that charcoal to blend it all together. So what I can do is take out the pencil marks by scrubbing it with a blending stick. Then I go into that extra soft charcoal very delicately and press my, my blending stump into it and just pull down or pull up into the direction of the light. And what that will do is it will leave the darkest parts of the charcoal that you drew in with pencil. That will remain the darkest parts of this, this cylinder. As you pull down or pull up toward the center of that cylinder, the paper takes off more and more charcoal, which cleans the blending stump, which means that as those lines get longer and longer, they will also get lighter and lighter. And it'll create the illusion of darkness on the top and bottom, leaving a section of light in the very middle. Now the other thing you can see me doing here is I'm not scrubbing because I want those each individual line that I'm drawing to, to be a gradient of its own. But also remember that this cylinder does have texture to it. It's got little ridges that happen all, all along. It's just the design of the case. 
if I use single individual strokes like this, I'm going to automatically be adding those ridges in because it's going to show up as single individual strokes. So we're kind of uh, gaming the system a little bit here and getting around having to draw in the ridges because they naturally happen when I take single strokes like this. It's almost the same method that you use to draw hair or one of the methods that you can use to draw hair. Then to add highlights, all I have to do is go back in with a Tombow eraser and very, very lightly drop in some sort of uh, slightly curvy lines in the very, very middle, and those will come off as bright light reflections. The reason that I draw them curvy is because remember, you're not on a flat surface, you're on a cylinder. So that needs to have the same sort of curve that the top and the bottom have. Now we're going to start on the hands and there are a couple things that we need to keep in mind. First, what I'm going to do is I'm getting a brand new Q-tip because the brand new ones will be more dense and compact than the ones that we're used to using. The reason we're doing that is because the hand in the background is out of focus, but it's not so out of focus that it will be fuzzy like the picture that we drew in the background, like the painting on the wall. We need the shadows to be a little bit more defined than that but we don't want them so defined that they look like the face and the hair that we've already drawn in the foreground it's going to be a, a level of blurry that's halfway between the blurriest parts of the background and the sharpest parts of the foreground if we take a brand new q-tip and dirty it up and basically start drawing in the hand with that q-tip it will automatically make that a level of blurriness that we're comfortable with that looks good. There's no extra trickery here. It's just that instead of using a pencil, we're going to draw the whole thing with a Q-tip. What I'm doing is I'm picking out the darkest parts of the shadows in this hand and I'm drawing them first. As I draw those with a Q-tip, the paper pulls off more and more charcoal, which means that the Q-tip is naturally going to start uh, shading lighter and lighter as we go because it's becoming less dirty, it's becoming cleaner. So if we draw in the shadows with the Q-tip at its dirtiest, then we can sort of scrub to the lightest areas of the hand and it will naturally get lighter and lighter as we go toward those areas because we're cleaning the Q-tip as we scrub. As we get closer to uh, things like her neck and especially that dress, we have to be really careful. Because the dress is done with extra soft charcoal, if we happen to uh, overlap the hand that we're working on with that dress and we get the Q-tip into the dress area, we're going to accidentally pick up 
very, very black charcoal, and it's going to smudge everything. The dress itself, the edge of the dress, is going to blur because there's going to now be a soft gradient along that edge. So we have to be very careful to get as close as possible without actually bringing the Q-tip into that area. This is one of those cases where if you're not intermediate or expert in doing a drawing like this, I would suggest that you draw in this hand and the background first as your very first step of the drawing. Then go back in and start building up the faces and stuff that are sharper in the foregrounds. Because that will, it, it's an easier process because you can erase away the hand, the blurry hand that overlaps the skin and you can shade over the top of the parts that, that kind of blur into the dress area. But what we're doing right now is we're being careful that it doesn't get too close to that area. And then if it does, we have to be extraordinarily careful with an eraser uh, because we need to soften up the parts that overlap without destroying the texture and the smoothness of the shadows that already exist within the face. You can do this. I mean, obviously I'm doing it here. Uh, but it does take a, a much more skilled hand and a lot more practice in order to pull that off without, you know, leaving eraser marks or smudge marks in areas where you don't want them. But I will tell you this, there's an advantage to doing it this way. Um, and there's two of them that I can think of. One is it forces you to practice extremely delicate pencil strokes and shading techniques uh, in order to not ruin what you've already done. And two, there's like a psychological thing that happens once you've completed a face or something really detailed like, you know, the, in this one I've got two faces. But once you create one of the foreground objects and it gets close to being done and you can see the progress that you've done, there's a psychological like switch that flips that makes you think this is worth finishing. Like I, I have to finish this now because I really like the way the first part turned out. So at this point, even if I got bored with this drawing, I like the first face that I drew so much that I, I wouldn't want to stop the drawing. This is one of the drawings where I was actually almost angry that I had to stop it. And when I wasn't drawing on the drawing, I was thinking about how I couldn't wait to get back in there and finish this one. There were actually nights where I woke up after only like three or four hours of sleep and I couldn't stop thinking about wanting to finish this drawing. So I just got up and continued working on it because I couldn't bear the thought of like having to go back asleep. And it's, it's almost like a, a kid on Christmas morning. As soon as you know it's December 25th, it doesn't matter if it's 4 a.m., you're up. You want to open the presents now. And I, I got that feeling with this drawing and it, that doesn't happen often with me. So I wanted to take advantage of it and uh, use that motivation to get it finished. Finishing that first face, um, even though it, it created problems for me with the background later on, created that motivation for me to finish it. I'm using a different style for this background hand and arm. There's a style I've mentioned before that I, I call dirty realism. And all it is is we're doing a, a rougher version of realism, but we're going to keep it in a drawing that's, that's designed more for uh, more like photo realism. And there's, I, I really like using this because it's dirty and rough and there's still a bunch of pencil marks on it. Then as you come forward closer to the, the quote unquote camera, as you get closer to that, the details sharpen up and become more realistic by comparison. So as you see this background uh, hand and the, the arms and stuff, it's not just that they're fuzzy. I'm intentionally leaving in a bunch of pencil marks and scrub marks here so that this is the part of the drawing that looks drawn. And I've done the same thing with the, uh, the painting in the background. I've, I've made that intentionally rough and I've left in a ton of scrub marks and a ton of pencil marks. And then 
when this entire thing is done, it doesn't just look out of focus. The viewer will notice the women in the photograph first, or the photograph, the drawing first. Then as they look at that background, it looks more and more drawn. And so that's the part to me that gives it a lot of character. If you personally, like if you don't want that look to your drawing, that's an easy fix. You just spend more time smoothing it out and that's it. You just take more care in dropping those in with a Q-tip and making sure that you blend away the scrub marks and you, you smooth out the gradients to make sure they're not chunky and they don't overlap as much. It takes more time to do it that way and um, it would look more realistic if you did it that way, but that's, that's not what I want for this particular background. We will be going into other drawings in the future where we go into absolute photorealism, and that's when you get into things that are closer to like hyperrealism, which we'll, we'll learn at some point too. But I try with something like this, especially something that has a little bit of emotion to it and tells a story, I need to give it some something in the the drawing that makes it that gives it a little bit more character that makes it look a little bit more interesting that tells the viewer that it's a drawing like right off the bat and I I think that this this method of doing a background is probably my favorite way of of getting that across I'm going to go into repeating mode here, so brace yourself. Drop it in, refine it later. If there's only one thing that you take away from any of these videos, it's that that I keep repeating over and over. We're dropping in the basic shape and the basic uh, like highlights and, and shadows, and we're creating varying layers of contrast and tone here. But basically it boils down to we're dropping in blobs of gray. And we're getting that in the shape of a hand, but we're not going for absolute realism right off the bat. I want to make sure that we got the fingernail there. I want to make sure that the fingers themselves are there. The major shadows are all there. We can shape those later and refine them and turn them into a more realistic looking hand. But we're, we're more concerned about getting that space filled right now than we are making it look like we took a photograph of a hand. Now the thing that we need to keep in mind the entire time we're doing this hand is that we need to be comparing the darkness of that skin tone to the lightness of the skin tone on the girl. And so this is, remember, the darkest parts of any of the shadows, uh, skin tone wise, in the entire drawing. We need to get this pretty close right off the bat because look at the contrast between that hand and the cheek on the girl. It really creates a sense of depth there. And so we need to make sure that we're not doing this too light.
We also need to remember that when we go to the second hand, which would be her left hand and the hand that's closer to us um, from a point, the camera's point of view, that hand is going to be much lighter than the hand that's behind it. Because it's capturing more light, it's not embedded in as much shadow. So we need to make sure there's a contrast between the top hand and the hand in the furthest distance. And as we're doing that, we're also going to be comparing that hand to the skin tone on the girl. Because that hand is darker than the skin tone on the girl, but lighter than the hand that's below it. So we need to make sure that we're keeping that basic idea in mind whenever we're laying this in. The other part is that this hand is going to be more in focus than the hand behind it. So even though we're going to have a little bit of blur here and there's not going to be as much detail in this hand, it's not going to be as fuzzy, as out of focus, and as unrefined as the hand that's in the background. So instead of doing a ton of that with just Q-tips, we're going to bring the blending stump in to add just a tiny bit more detail to it. We don't want to really use a pencil here because that's too sharp and it will make too much of a, a detail clash between what's behind it versus what's in front. So the blending stump seems to be perfect here because it adds a tiny, tiny bit of fuzziness to the edges of the fingers, but not so much that it washes into the background hand. We're basically using the same method as we did with a Q-tip. It's just that instead of drawing it with a Q-tip, we're now drawing it with a blending stump. Now, as we get more and more of this hand to, to start to take shape, one of the ways that we can sharpen up the details on the foreground hand is by going into the background hand and darkening up the shadows that meet. So I can go back into this thumb and I can darken up the shadows that butt up against the, the woman's left hand. And that will naturally sharpen the edge of the left hand without us having to do anything on the interior of that hand. So we're doing the outside edge of the hand by refining the, uh, the, the background parts.
once we have the details of the fingers in there, we can go back with a Q-tip and start doing the bulk of the hand. Now, we could do that later. The timing on this is not important, except that I want to get more of this drawing done to further reinforce that motivation to finish the drawing. The more space I get filled in, the more done it feels. So I got a couple fingers done and I could have easily just gone on and finished the rest of the fingers, but I saw that big white splotch of paper looking at me and I thought, that's a pretty easy area to finish. That's just a Q-tip and making sure that I get the, the gradients correct here. I could do that in just a couple minutes. So I grabbed a Q-tip, I'm gonna knock it out real quick. I'm laying in the basic idea and then we can go back and like I, I mentioned many, many times, we can refine that later. But for right now, psychologically, as I see this being built out, I see less and less uh, white paper, unworked paper, and it just feels like that finish line is right there. As I'm doing this, I keep uh, going back to the girl's cheeks because that kind of is the landmark for me. Remember when we, when we first start doing this drawing, or any drawing, the landmarks are very small. Like if we start drawing in the eyelashes, that is a tiny little landmark to work off of to remind us where we are in the drawing. As we get more and more of the drawing done, the landmarks become larger and larger. So now I'm not just looking at the corner of an eye as a landmark, and I'm not just looking at a particular part of the ear as a landmark. I'm looking at her entire face, hair, cheeks, nose, everything, as one big landmark to compare the rest of the drawing to. And so as I'm doing this hand, I look from the hand to her cheeks, make a comparison and say, this hand needs to be just a little bit darker in order to stick out um, from the girl's skin tone. Because if we get that all the same skin tone, we, it will, we'll basically have the same shade of gray going across the entire drawing. And that's what makes a drawing like this look flat and boring and two-dimensional. There's too much of one shade of gray. So we need a lot of varying tones and varying contrasts in order to make this drawing look interesting. So that's why I look from the hand to the cheek, back to the hand, over and over and over again as I'm laying in these tones and these gradients so that I get the darkness correct and then I make sure that even if it's correct via the original photograph, I may have to make some adjustments in drawing form in order to create a difference between this hand and the cheeks. Don't be afraid to do that. If you're in a drawing and you're noticing the drawing looks too samey across, you know, it, it looks too flat and washed out, don't be afraid to go back into like one part of that drawing and darken that up a little bit and create your own tones. Because a lot of times what's in the photograph looks fine for a photograph, but doesn't translate well to a drawing. When you hear somebody talk about artistic license, that's one of the many things they mean by that. Artistic license could be creating contrast and tone where it doesn't exist in the reference photo. It could also mean you're creating uh, entire new pieces of content within that drawing. Like if we wanted to add in like a dog or something in the background, that would be considered artistic license. Another thing is changing the actual details of the face. So if we didn't want to create an exact replica of this girl, if we wanted to change the shape of her eyes and turn her into something else, we could do that. That's artistic license. The, the way that I hear artistic license used the most, though, especially among amateurs and intermediates, is they couldn't re replicate the details from the original drawing. And so instead of saying, I couldn't do that, they call it artistic license. <laughs> It's totally fine to say that and do that is because I've done it. I, I've done it my whole life until I learned how to do actual replication. I just I find it funny because that was my cheap way out as an artist who couldn't do replication at the time. I would just say I, just, I took artistic license on this and changed kind of the shape of her her lips and I changed the, the sort of roll of her nose because I liked it better this way. 
in reality, I just, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I messed it up. It's kind of like when a chef calls something deconstructed <laughs> because they messed up the dish. So they just throw it together. If you watch MasterChef, you see that a lot. I messed up the crust on this pie. So I'm just going to put it in a pile as organized as I can and call it deconstructed. It's chef for I screwed up this dish. <laughs> And that's fine. People still like it. I mean, it's not like anybody's going to know this reference photo anyway. I showed it once at the beginning of this series, and then I don't want to keep going back and forth to it because there are going to be things in this drawing that are not exact. And that's, that's fine. I'm looking at this as an overall piece. I want the feeling to come across more than I want the actual skill level to come across. I really like the look of this drawing. I really like the aesthetics. But one of the first things that I want people to notice when they see this drawing is the scene first. And I'll, I'll explain briefly why I think that's important. I don't do a lot of drawings that have an emotional attachment to them. But I really love what this one uh, says. I love how you can kind of tell when you look at it that this is like the first time this girl has been allowed to do Things like getting her hair done front to finish and wearing full makeup and putting on these fancy, beautiful clothes and she's wearing jewelry and all that. She's being treated more like an adult. She's part of an important event. And so it, to her, she's that excitement and that seriousness she's trying to put on her face as she's getting the makeup put on her. She's learning how to do it and she's becoming a part of this thing. On the right, once we get that face put in, there's a level of concentration in the look and she's trying to uh, put it on so delicately and trying not to mess it up. But she's also dealing with a girl who's really excited and maybe a tiny bit jumpy. So she's trying to kind of hold, she almost has to grab her arm to hold her still, which you can see that position of the hand in the far background. And the connection between those, those two is beautiful to me. And I want that to come across. Obviously, as an artist, I want people to notice that skill, and I, I want people to be impressed with what I did here um, as, as an art form. But one of the things that, as I get older, I want to try to put into my drawings is some emotion, is some feeling, is some action, and a sort of scene that goes with it. And I think this is, of all the things I've ever drawn, it's the thing I'm the most proud of because I do think that comes across when we get the entire thing done. Now you may notice something right off the bat, and that is her fingers look really like stubby and short. That's another one of those things where it's put it in now and refine it later. I'm aware as I put these in that I've not made those shadows that define the edges of her fingers like between her fingers. I'm aware that that's not long enough. I could go back in and fix it right now, but I've kind of got my head in another area, which is I want to kind of finish these fingers uh, for the most part. I want to get that paper filled in. Part of doing that is adding in the darkest parts of the shadows along the edges of the fingers and then working to lighter areas. The fix for making those fingers look less stubby and, and a little longer is so simple. It's just taking a blending stump and pulling those lines down a little bit more. I think I add maybe a half an inch to those um, and that will instantly make that hand look more like a hand and less like a drawing. The biggest thing about doing this particular hand, the one in the foreground, it's not so much the details, it's the shape and the shadows need to be on the money. If we get those exactly right, uh, which we will later, especially when we go into touch-ups, we'll create the illusion of reality. We'll trick people's brains into thinking that looks more realistic than it actually is. And again, we're also tricking them into thinking that the foreground faces and hair look more realistic than they actually are by creating a background that's out of focus and fuzzy. We get so used to seeing that background being out of focus and fuzzy that by comparison, it makes the foreground look sharper. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing human hands is that there are 
a lot of varying tones of gray here, and not all of them are shadows. Human Hand has got all kinds of things that makes the, the, the colors and the, uh, the gray tones uh, differ. Part of that is shadow. The other part is the hands get worn a lot more than the rest of the body. So if you work with your hands a lot, the fingertips may be darker than the rest of the fingers. There's also going to be places between the knuckles where you get things like hair, uh, you get calluses and things like that. You also get these little bones that go along the top, uh, bones and like tendons that go along the tops of the fingers. Those can add shadows where they normally, like you wouldn't expect them to be. So it's important to get, in order to get hands to look like hands and to, to get them to look real, you really have to pay attention to all the different areas where the gray variates from each other. And don't get tricked into thinking that you're just dealing with shadows and then a flat skin tone. If you ever draw a hand and it looks too shiny or too much like, uh, almost like plastic, like it was created um, artificially, one of the reasons is because you've concentrated too much on the shadows and not enough on the varying tones that happen between the knuckles. So like underneath her ring, you'll notice there's like a dark splotch. That's not really a shadow there. That's more like a worn part of her hand. It, I mean, some of it is shadow, but you, you have to actually add in the worn part of her fingers that over time has developed things like calluses and things like that. If I were to draw this hand without those little extra dark splotches here and there, it would look like that lipstick case. It would look artificial and created, you know, like by a machine. And by the way, at this point, if you look at that hand in the background, I'm pretty happy with the darkness there. We may touch it up a bit later. But notice how it looks splotchy and kind of uh, really rough. At this point, if you wanted to go back and make that look more realistic and a lot smoother, you can. Um, I would suggest getting this hand done first and then going back to that. And one of the ways that you can blend all that together and make it look smoother is to use a Q-tip that, that is totally clean, a brand new Q-tip, and just very carefully in small circles start blending that all together. If you add just a little bit of extra charcoal to it while you're doing it, you'll be able to darken that up uniformly all the way across and still pull off the same effect of, of blending those together. Personally, this is one of the places of artistic license that I'm going to take and I, I want to leave it rough like that, but it's an easy fix if you're not happy with it being that rough. Some people get to the point where they look at the faces and the, the sharp details they put in, and they feel like roughness ruins that. So like a lot of people would look at the painting that I've done in the background and think that looks way too rough and that it ruins the effect of the drawing. If that's the case and you want that to be smoother, it's the same exact method to, to uh, sort of quote unquote correct it. Just go back in with a blank Q-tip, small circles, tedious, take like an hour and blend all that stuff together and you can get rid of the stroke marks there. But look at the hand that we've done so far. We've done this mostly with just a blending stump, the foreground hand. And compared to the fuzzy rough one in the background, this looks way more realistic, and we haven't really put any more detail into this than we have in any other part of the, the drawing, especially compared to the background hand. It's just that by direct comparison, it looks more realistic because your eyes are saying the one in the background is way more out of focus and fuzzy, and the one in the foreground is a lot sharper and a lot more quote-unquote real. Points of comparison, for me, are the most important uh, parts of a drawing. We're doing a lot of brain manipulation <laughs> in doing one of these. It's very psychological, it's very intimate. It's why people like drawings like this. They don't know they're being manipulated, but they are. It's why if you ever watch Bob Ross, he talks a lot about we're gonna create the illusion of a rock, the illusion of water. We're gonna create the illusion of leaves because he is, he's just tapping 
a paintbrush to canvas and all of a sudden there's leaves there. If you look close at it and you study just that section, it just looks like he smashed a paintbrush against canvas and that's just the texture of the brush. But when you look at it overall compared to everything else that he's painted, then your brain is tricked into thinking that those are leaves he put on there. It's no different with a, uh, a drawing. It's just that we go into a lot more tedious detail in order to pull it off. We can't just smash a, a Q-tip into the paper and suddenly create a fingernail. Well, there's a lot more scrubbing and, and fine details involved, but, but the psychology, the technique, is, is basically the same. The, the mental technique is basically the same.
Now since I want this to be smoother than the hand behind it, I am going to take a Q-tip in and start blending all these strokes out. At least a lot of them. We can leave some of them in there. But for the most part, I do want this to be a lot smoother so we can just blend those together with those small circles that I was talking about earlier. All right, let's get into this ring. This is way simpler than what you might think. It's basically the same technique as what we used for the necklace. The only difference is this is a little closer to the camera and it's a little larger than the material on the necklace. So what I've done is I've identified in the original photograph, the reference photo, that these stones have sort of a, I don't know, almost like a hexagon shape to them. And very roughly, all I have to do is create those more hexagonal as they face the camera and a little less detail as they curve away from the camera. So as they go around the top and the bottom of her, her ring finger, there's a little less detail. Now the ones that face us are going to have the same light properties as the rest of the drawing. The very middle of it is going to have a slight highlight. The edges, uh, specifically the tops and bottoms, are going to be darker. But since it's such a, a small space that we're working on, we don't have to put in a ton of detail here. We're getting the idea of a dark splotch that represents darker colored stones with a little light reflection in the middle. Then in between each of those stones there's a lighter colored stone. It's diamonds in between those. And so what we can do is leave those white and then we go back in with a uh, blending stump. We take out the pencil marks from the dark stone which dirties up the blending stump. Then we can go back in with the rest of the detail on the ring and just add in small things like mid-tone shadows, mid-tone reflections, uh, a little bit of a shadow between the ring and finger to separate those out. Now if there's anything that I would have changed in the final product of this drawing, it would have been to slightly refine the shape of that ring because to me it's not it doesn't feel perfectly round the way a ring does there's a slight bend to it that happens on the left hand side and that would have been an easy fix but i just didn't think of it before i sealed the entire drawing with fixative i'm still happy with the way it looks but there's kind of a, a detail oriented part of me an obsessive part that wishes I would have taken about 10 seconds to go back in and slightly adjust the shadow on the ring both on the top and the bottom and just a little one millimeter change could have made that ring look a tiny bit rounder. But really the process is pretty simple, right? I mean it's use a pencil to add in the dark parts, smooth out the pencil marks, then we go back in with the blending stump and add in those mid-tones, shadows, reflections, and whatnot. And just like that, within like a minute, we have a ring made. Which is funny to me because you would think that a piece of jewelry that fine and that small compared to the rest of the drawing would be a complete pain to do. But really, it's one of the simplest things that we can add in. I think that's a good stopping place for today. Uh, when we get into it uh, on the next video, we will be getting a, a much larger section of this drawing done. We'll, we'll start on things like uh, the woman's hair on the right. We'll get her arm laid in. We'll start to get some of the details of her face put in. When we get toward the end of that, which I think it would only be about another video or two in this series, you're going to see some straight up witchcraft type stuff happen with this dark hair. And I'm, I'm so excited to show you how to do these curls because it's a totally different method from what we worked on in, on the first hair. And it's gonna kind of blow your mind to show you how simple it is to add some of these in. But regardless, I will see you on the next video. Thank you so much for watching. And if you haven't already subscribed, please do. I'm trying to grow this channel and every subscription counts. Thank you so much.